Fate here is to be ripped from all that you know and plunged into all that you fear. Travel Britain today, and you can hear stories of exile and migration in every town. But our story comes from a Britain of over 200 years ago, when this island was a smaller, harder place, where most people in their lives never saw more than 10 miles from where they lived. They could scarce imagine what lay over the hills, let alone the other side of the world. Let's head east, as far as we can go, to the counties of Suffolk and Norfolk. Here is a land apart, in places so flat you cannot hide from the eye of God, and often so wet, so low, you can be suddenly engulfed by sea or river or marsh. There's a fear of inundation here, and it rises where the counties meet along the river Waveney. Here, midway beside this flowing border, lies a village called Mendham, once circled by marshes, still prey to rising waters. And in this village there lives a family called Cable, father, mother, and son Henry, a boy, soon to be a man. But all is not well with the cables, for there is no work. And when there is no work, there is no food. Once, the father would have traveled for employment. But now he is tied to his kin. He's a good man, but he's becoming desperate. And as he looks across the river into Norfolk, he can see rich houses for the picking. He's a good man, but he's a desperate man. And he's becoming tempted.
He's a good man, but he's a desperate man, and he's becoming tempted. A man that is willing can't understand why he can find no employment, how hard he may try, and it breaks his poor heart for to see his wife cry. Poor fellow, he'll do what he can. And a man that is desperate and can't find a job, he will not be contented to sit home and sob. Be he ever so honest, he'll turn. Scorn and misfortune on his honest name. But in pitiful straits, tell me who is to blame? Poor fellow, you know he must try. So let's hope that these hard times may soon pass away. Unto This dark cloudy morn brings a glorious day. Poor fellows, sometime ere we die. If Henry's father was a good man, then his father's friend Abe Carmen was not. Abe needed no hardship to force him into a life of crime. He loved it. He lived for the thrill of theft, and he despised those who lived straight. He said, there are plenty of ways to die boring. So let me live free. Let me run free. Let me steal free. Till the day that I hang. <laughs> is it common and you might find me alarming if you think that there is harm in the trade of burglary i live by taking chances like those heroes of romances and by taking what i fancies from those wealthier than me yes there are goods all for the taking and there is no mistaking there is little you'll be making on the straight and narrow path like toiling for the masters and bowing to the pastors those cruel heartless bastards who would see a poor man starve old companions i have seen them cast off all thoughts of freedom as their wives and babies need them and the bread for which they slave so they pride they learn to humble being never heard to grumble but before i take that trouble you will find me in my grave so they goes to be a soldier with the muskets on their shoulder but they never grows no older once the generals ride to war and the lads who plow the ocean which they'd never thought the notion as commanders seek promotion on a tide of sailors go thank you henry oh this i may be a poor lowly robber but this is a folk instrument how difficult can it be Okay, as a robber it seems only fitting that I should say, let's take it away! It's a steal! But let those who 
will bow under Like a man who hides some thunderbolt As long as I can plunder I will steer my course and lord back No wife will ever mold me No tyrant will control me No bride will door will hold me And my soul will be my own And so when the night comes falling I'll attend them to my calling You will never find me crawling To the lofty gentry With me pistols on the high road And me cudgels in the by road Every road is my road When I walk it strong and free Take it lads I'm a gate to hold a candle lad, And I'm to break a handle lad, And lad to spy the land And I will rub all great small To my lucky dough can take me On the day they come and take me And on the gallows break me Well that will pay for all There's a saying amongst criminals, don't thieve too close to home, put distance between you and your crime. Maybe Abe Carmen thought it was enough to cross a river into another county, but the house that he chose to burgle, that of Mrs. Abigail Hambling, was only two and a half miles away, almost neighbors, and you can't hide much from neighbors. Anyway, Abe and his two amateur accomplices went a-thieving. Young Henry watched the house while the two older men stole inside. Then, laden with their gains, they rode home. Such sudden wealth was swift, and it was easy. There weren't many police in those days. 18th century justice depended on two things. Firstly, informers. And it wasn't long till somebody talked. And all three men were arrested and brought before the assizes at Thetford. And secondly, justice depended upon deterrent. For their crime of stealing some of Mrs. Hambling's furnishings and wine, all three men were sentenced to hang. That's what happened if you stole property back then. You were executed. It was swift. It was easy. But the system still allowed some mercy. So Henry's mother stood up in court. She knew she'd lost her husband, but maybe she could save her son. So she begged for Henry's life. And she succeeded. The judge said the young man need not be hanged. Instead, he would be transported, carried away in chains to the other side of the world for seven years, but most likely never to return. So she saved her son, but her family is destroyed. And three weeks later, on a cold April morning, on the steep green hill beneath Norwich Castle, she watched her husband swing beside the man who had brought him to this fate. Maybe Abe played to the crowd. People loved a hanging, and they loved a fearless exit. And Abe had boasted, till me luck it do forsake me, and on the day when they do take me, and on the gallows break me, and that will pay for all. But it won't pay for her loss. She's lost her entire family now. She curses the world, and she curses what once was good, like love and marriage. And she warns young women, don't get wed. All sorrows lie there. Oh, the grass in the meadow, the reeds by the mere. The sad boom of the bittern is all that I hear. And the leaves in the woodland and the gulls by the shore cry. You never shall sit by your loved ones no more. You never shall sit by your loved ones no more. When I was a young girl, this world 
But these cruel hard times do drive comfort away. And there leaves in the woodland, and the gulls by the shore cry. You never shall dance with your sweetheart no more. You shall dance with your sweetheart no more. Once I gathered wild flowers in the sweet countryside, but my gardens have withered, my posies is all I find there. I'll go down to the river to ease all my pain. And who knows, but I might find my dear Henry sits in prison. All he has got to look forward to now are chains, maggots, and stink. Most criminals in Georgian England were either executed or exiled. Justice was about removal, not rehabilitation. And prisons were but holding pens, temporary digs on the way to the scaffold or the transport ship. But Henry arrived at an unusual time when the prisons were full to bursting. Traditionally, convicts were sent to America. Ever since tiny Britain grabbed these huge colonies, it needed the cheap labor. 
the free labor to exploit those colonies. But this is 1784, and America has gone offline. The colonies have independence, and they're so gorged on African slaves, they have no need of refuse labor from Britain. But Britain has nowhere else to send its convicts, so the prisons keep getting fuller. Now, most of these prisons were privately run. They existed to make profit, and profit means that corners must be cut. Where does this lead? Well, we've seen where this leads these past few winters. We've seen how underfunding and overcrowding leads to riot in Bedford, Birmingham, Lincoln, Hull. And in Norwich Jail, 7084, it's the same shit. See the last of Norwich Jail. The food is foul, the air is bad, the company no choice. Twould make you scowl to hear that mad old turkey's rasping voice. Twould make you wonder, would you ever live to tell the tale of the hardships and the miseries we've known in Norwich Jail? Our beds is heaps of straw There's water running down the walls And rats running on the floor There's naught to eat but rotten meat That'd make a dog turn pale Oh, it's dainty board and lodging When you visit Norwich Jail So early in the morning a concert we rattles of our chains and if we want a banquet we drink sludge and call it ale if you want a good time commit a crime and come to Norwich Jail Now if you fancy gaming the race is run by fleas the stakes are perilously high a crust of mouldy cheese First time that I tried me luck, I nearly lost me shirt. But lucky for me, they couldn't see the bugger or the dirt. So early in the morning, the turkey rings his bell. So early in the morning. sent us to America, today we would be free. But since the revolution, that land will never see. We are not for New England shores, 3,000 miles away. They say we're bound for further ground, they called it Botany Bay. Well, perhaps it's out by India, or maybe just off the coast of Canada or in the hills of Spain But wherever that strange land may be, we know it cannot fail To be a far, far better place than stinking Norwich Jail So early in the morning the turkey rings his bell Last 
Henry sits in jail, waiting to be removed from everyone and everything he's ever known. He might be thinking his life is over, but hey, his life is about to begin. For while in prison, he meets somebody, someone of similar age and similar situation. Both faced hanging, but were reprieved, and now both their lives are on hold. And what is the name of this new friend? Susanna Holmes. Yes, a woman. Norwich Jail in 1784 may seem an unlikely place to fall in love, but that's what happened. In time, Susanna will be voted one of the hundred most influential women in the history of Australia, but for now, she's an illiterate maid from Norfolk, and she's been caught stealing some spoons. Like Henry, she comes from the bottom of the social heap, but as a maid, her life has been very different from his. She's already been in prison. I mean, you can't blame her for choosing to enter service. As a maid, you're guaranteed something to wear, something to eat, somewhere to sleep. But there's a trade-off. In service, you surrender your freedom. A maid cannot marry. A maid must work every hour they're awake. They are a prisoner to the house that feeds them. Now, that may be bearable if you're desperate, but what if you're ambitious? What if you want more? Susanna wants more. She doesn't know what it is yet. How could she know? She knows little of life outside her village, but she knows that she wants to live. And if she wants to live, she'll have to leave. And if she wants to leave, then as a maid, she'll need money. So she steals some silver spoons, and she has no regrets about what she's done and where it's led her.
for stealing some spoons. Susanna was sentenced to death, reduced to 14 years transportation. But in prison, she's happy. She's no longer a maid. And she's got company. So Susanna regrets little, and in prison she meets Henry, who knows little. Both have lost their families, both their lives are on hold, but together they can imagine new families, new lives. As they sit amidst the darkness of the cell, they gaze up at the window high above, and they dare to dream of a world beyond. If you look out from some high, high window, you will see the sun set beyond the town. You will see the rocks to the treetops screaming, and the wing of evening comforting down. Between the morning and the evening, between the springtime and the winter dream, there comes a time of new beginning when sweet loving friendship drives away all fear. There is many here, they know not but sorrow, and like the beasts they live from day to day. But we can think on a bright tomorrow, since we love in friendship drives all grief away. All Say 
window and see the sun set beyond the sky. You need not mourn at the coming shadow if some loving friend is standing nigh. <laughs> Year passes year, and this young couple enjoy an unusual freedom in Norwich jail. They can live together, they can lie together. In 1786, the hellish limbo of this prison is disrupted by a different kind of scream, that of their baby boy. These two orphans of justice have made a new family. Meanwhile, 120 miles away in London, prison hulks are backing up in the Thames. The establishment are scared. They've always feared being engulfed by the mob, but now they have reason to fear. The French Revolution, only three years away. In Britain, the prisons are overflowing and there's a whiff of revolt in the air. Whitehall looks desperately for somewhere else to send its criminals. It considers places like Gambia, Madagascar, Cape Town, but none of these feel right because quite simply white convicts don't survive in Africa. Just at this moment, the officials are visited by a certain James Matra, a man who sailed the world with Captain Cook, and he's got a map and an idea. This may be a bold notion, but I remember back in 1770, saw somewhere that may be fit for your purposes. Botany Bay, we called it. Well, we didn't stay long, but seemed fertile and fit for human settlement. Maybe we should take a look, said the officials. Are you in a hurry? <laughs> yes. That may be a problem. Takes 18 months to get there and back, and well, <laughs> you might not actually get back. So you're suggesting that we send thousands of chained criminals, plus their guards, plus all that's needed to create a penal colony from scratch, the guardsmen, the tradesmen, the suppliers, the tools, the supplies, to an unknown rock, 10,000 miles away, seen once by one British ship, 17 years ago. Yes. And it's more like 15,000 miles. Well, this was madness. A wild gamble. Um, this was madness. <laughs> it was a wild gamble, but they did it. And plans started for the first fleet to New South Wales. 11 ships with 736 convicts, 578 civilians and soldiers, and all that was needed to create a penal colony from scratch. Then someone thought, a bit late, that there's no point in creating a colony with only men. So word went out to gather female convicts, and a letter reached the governor of Norwich Jail outlining three women prisoners who must be hastened to Plymouth to join the fleet. One of those named was Susanna Holmes, but there was no mention of Henry Cable. Henry begged that they might marry so they could go together, but a wedding in jail was a liberty too far for this governor, so Susanna and the baby were taken away. So now, having lost his first family, Henry's second family is being ripped from him too. The woman whose love sustained him in jail, the child that offered hope of a new life. Maybe his mother was right. It's best not to love in the first place. Henry sits sad within his cell, 
and he sings a lament to all those who have lost everything. It is cold, sad and lonely in this dismal cell. No solace comes up with the day. My heart knows an anguish that no tongue can tell, for they've taken my true love away. Oh, the black and bitter night, and all oh, the weary day. My love has been snatched far, far from my sight, and the transports will bear her away. When first to this prison so deep was my pain, then she came and she banished dismay. But now in despondence I'm drowning again, for they've taken my true love away. Though surrounded by horrors, yet we found delight, for where love is, no sorrow can stay. But misery and squalor swim back to my sight Now they've taken my true love away Oh, the black and bitter night And all the weary day my The grasses still grow, and the streams still downflow, and the blackbird still sings on the spray. But in dank, dreary dungeons, there is nothing but war when they've taken your true love away. If I was a seagull, I'd fly to her side, and it's there that I wish I could stay. But soon the cruel prison ship leaves with the tide, and it's bearing my true love away. And if I were a heron, I'd wait by the slip, though I waited a year and a day. And through the wide ocean, I follow the ship that is bearing my true love away. moment of play for all you will have is what's left in your mind if they 
Sometimes you have to dive straight into what frightens you most. Hesham Modamani was on the run from government thugs in Damascus. He got as far as Western Turkey, but then his path was blocked by the sea. Only five miles of sea, but no boat could cross it undetected. And the water was cold, it was dangerous, it was dark. But Hesham and his friend Ferris have no choice. They cannot go back to Syria, but neither can they afford any other way to go forwards. So late one evening in the late spring, they stuffed their money, their papers, their mobile phones, their chargers into watertight bags. They sealed the bags. They put the bags around the neck. And then they stepped carefully into that dark water. They spent five hours in the water, dodging patrols, braving shipping lanes, watching as birds of prey eyed them from above. And in one oddly joyful moment, Hesham swam on his back, gazed up at the stars, and for the first time in so long, he felt a sense of peace. But then, midstream, with the waves now towering over them, Hesham realized he could swim no more. Death beckoned. Could this be another anonymous drowning in the eastern Mediterranean? And off we swam, and the sea was 
On my back And the stars fell on me And I've not felt peace like that The stars For sea Dark water And I heard a cry Felt two arms holding me And I've not felt joy like that Pulled from the sea Dark water It's not the same For I I am the same A million voices sing my name Dark water Hesham Modamani survived. He made it to Germany. And last week, Sean, who wrote and sang that song, met him in Berlin. And together with David and Michael from the Young'uns, they sang him Dark Water. History has always been shaped by the crossing of oceans by desperate people. Travel Britain today, you can hear stories of exile and migration in every town. On the very same boat as Henry and Susanna were nine convicts from the Assizes here in Shrewsbury. The youngest of them was John Bennett. He was described as a young man but an old rogue. And within four months of arriving in Botany Bay, he was hanged for stealing food. 
He wasn't yet 20. Thomas Stretch was a miller from Shrewsbury. He was on that boat as well. He was there going for seven years. And his crime? He'd stolen goods worth three shillings. He was hardly a hardened criminal. One of the most noted transported convicts from Shrewsbury was the wonderful Molly Morgan. She arrived on the second fleet in 1790. She survived a horrific passage in which one third of the convicts on her boat died. As soon as she arrived, she tried to escape. She succeeded. She made it back to Britain, but then was arrested again and again was sentenced to be transported back to Australia, where this time she served her term. And when it was finished, she became a farmer. She ran in. She became one of the wealthiest landowners in the Hunter Valley. She funded schools. She funded hospitals. She made good. People go. People come. Parallel lives. An 11-year-old boy and his mother crouch beside some other refugees in a boat as it approaches Harwich. They've escaped horror in their homeland. They now seek sanct sanctuary in Britain. They've been lucky. A couple of school teachers in Carnarvon answered an advertisement in The Guardian and vouchsafed their passage to Britain. But the father of the family could not come. And when they arrive, they are separated. The mother to go and work, the boy to Carnarvon. The year is 1938. They're Austrian Jews. The boy is so traumatized, they must remove the whistle from the kettle. It reminds him of the police rounding people up in the Vienna ghetto. The next year, they get lucky. The father comes over. It's March 1939 now, and he finds work here in Shrewsbury at the Silhouette Corset Factory, a factory built by refugees, German Jews, who'd been forced out of business in Germany. They'd come to London to set up business again, but again they were forced out by the Nazis, this time their bombs, and they came here to Shrewsbury. They became some of the main employers in the town. And Silhouette became one of the famous, most famous underwear and swimwear firms in Britain. And a steady stream of refugees made their way here, worked in the factory, and then lived their whole lives in this town. People come, people go. One of the things that Hesham said to Sean when they were in Berlin last week was, I may be a refugee, but I am not defined by it. I am something more than that. Think of that. Think also, think of the trauma that you feel when you lose a loved one. Most of us will have had that feeling. It cuts us in two. Now multiply that feeling for losing several, many loved ones, neighbors, friends. Add to it the horror of seeing people die around you. People you know, people you don't know. Blend in the constant fear of not knowing where your home would be. And then imagine the level of trauma being harbored within somebody who arrives here, a relatively peaceful country, where, of course, having jumped these hoops, is now expected to be a good refugee. Fortunately, there are many good organizations working to help people who arrive. In every town where we perform the show, we partner with a local organization as part of our Parallel Lives program. Here, we are delighted to partner with a wonderful organization called Shropshire Supports Refugees. Look out for them. They do good work. History has always been shaped by the crossing of oceans by desperate people. Yes, such migration is rooted in pain. Yes, it can bring disbalance where it lands. But it also brings nutrients like youth and energy, essential for aging societies like ours. And whether people like it or not, it is inevitable. Yet in the White House, we have a violent demagogue 
who shuns the vulnerable, a germaphobe who fears contagion by anything that's strange to him. Here in Europe, borders are closing faster than at any time since the 1930s. Fear is winning. What can we do? Maybe by telling stories, by putting a face on migration, by showing how our own past is shaped by such transit, then maybe, just maybe, we can help to detoxify this debate. And talking of stories, it's now time to return to Henry and Susanna. And it's time for us to meet our hero. They've, oh dear. <laughs> our hero is called John Simpson. He's a turnkey, a jailer from Norwich. And he's not happy because he's been given a terrible job. He has to escort three female prisoners all the way from Norwich to Plymouth, 350 miles in chains on the open top of a coach. And he's not just carrying three women prisoners, he's also carrying a baby. <laughs> he's a reluctant custodian for these people. It's a terrible journey, but finally they reach Plymouth. And when they get there, he hastens them straight down to the docks to find their allotted ship. He's not yet been very heroic. Come rise you up, John Simpson. The governor did say these scum are chained and ready. And it's time you was away. Three women and a farthing child to Plymouth they are bound. And you must be their escort till they reach that distant town. When me and these poor convicts did arrive at Plymouth Strand, I marched them up all onto the deck, all chained hand to hand. The captain saw us come on board, and he did prove unkind. The women come, he did declare, but the infant stays behind. This proud, unfeeling seaman, Captain Gilbert was his name. Oh, to see a babe abandoned so. I swore it was a shame. I wrapped it up in my great coat. To the coach I went straightway. And I started out to London town without no more delay. So the nasty Captain Gilbert refuses to take the infant because its name is not upon his list. Susanna is dragged away, screaming that she'll kill herself. And Simpson is left holding the baby. Five minutes ago, he was all set to return to Norwich free, but now he's lumbered. What can he do? Well, what would usually happen, and this did happen, was that the jailer would find a sack, some stones, and a quiet part of the dock. Or he would leave the infant in the nearest workhouse. Either way, he would be free of it. But Simpson, remember, is our hero. He doesn't do the expected. He says, Damn it, justice must be done. He doesn't drown or dump the baby. Instead, he takes it with him, not to Norwich, but to London, for he knows that that's the only place he'll get justice. But he'd better hurry, because the fleet is getting ready to sail. Now, this is 1786. How long do you think it would take to travel the 200 miles from Plymouth to London? There's no M5. No M4, just muddy turnpikes, no street lights, and these are the long, dark nights of midwinter. Well, the fastest option available to John Simpson is that remarkable people carrier, the Plymouth Mail. This races along, changing only, stopping only to change horses every 10 miles, and it reaches London incredibly in only 40 hours. With six on top, four inside, a guard on the back with a blunderbuss, battling rain, wind, highwaymen, and stray sheep. There's one man who ensures the mail gets through on time. He's the king of the road, the coachman of the Plymouth Mail. <laughs> And the horn does blow The turnpike calls and I must go No wind, no sleep, no rain, no hail The halt, the driver of the famous mail I was
who's a lad I used to play The roadside all the live a long day Hoping always to espy The gentry's coaches are rolling by When I was a youth I used to roam The wagoner from town to town But I long to fly across this land On a stagecoach high four in hand Driver's box I in my stand Like the captain mold of a ship in sail And the man who drives the famous mail And the whip goes crack and the horn does blow The turnpike calls and I must go No wind, no sleep, no rain, no hail The host, the driver of the famous mail With six on top and four inside The post boy and the guard The open road Then the hoofs do fly And the wheels spin round We bid adieu to Plymouth Town Plimpton, Brent and Ashburton Pass to Exeter We come at last Then the horses blow And the sides do steam The yells alert run to change the team And the travellers drink a glass of ale And then back they scramble on the famous mail And the whip goes crack and the horn goes blow The turnpike calls and I must go No wind, no sleep, no rain, no hail The halt, the driver of the famous mail We roll across the Dorset Downs And stage once more in Shaftesbury Town I crack my whip with a might and main And on we roll the Salisbury Plain Chippers loom against the sky And the travellers, they hide their gold For fear we'll meet some robber's boys And the wind goes crack and the horn does blow The turnpike calls and I must go No wind, no sleep, no rain, no hail The halt, the driver of the flavour's mail By the sign of the standard in Cornhill at last my rolling wheels are still And the passengers all stiff and sore Thank God our journey is safely all In a cosy parlour now I stand Goodly bumper in my hand And the travellers raise a glass of ale To the health of the driver of the Plymouth Mail And the wind goes crack and the horn goes blow the turnpike calls and I must go No wind, no sleep, no rain, no hail The halt, the driver of the plane was And the whip goes crack and the horn does blow The turnpike calls and I must go No wind, no sleep, no rain, no hail The halt, the driver of the plane was John Simpson arrives in London. He's a jailer from Norwich. What does he know about going to get justice? Well, he knows how to ask. And just like in the movies, though this is a true story, he gathers a crowd around him. They're amazed at the sight of this muddy turnkey nursing a baby. They're roused by the story he tells. And like him, they are incensed. And they tell him he must go to the top to the house of Lord Sidney, the Home Secretary. Now when I came to London, having rode 200 miles, to see a turnkey nurse, a baby caused the crowd to smile. But hearing its sad history, it made the crowd to groan. And many a worthy citizen swore justice would be done. Sydney 
his house I went The crowd did follow on For they swore they would see charity Before the day was done When we came to Lord Sydney's house It was the hour of nine We all came bursting in on him As he sat down to dine He listened to my story And his countenance was great Then declared the tear the week was out The family would be saved Lord Sidney wrote two letters And he signed them with his hand One to Plymouth, one to Norwich Bidding them to understand That young cable and the baby with Susanna were to go As a united family unto that distant shore Now I'm home again in Norwich And some other trade I'll seek As a coachman, a wagoner, a shopman or a sweep Perhaps I'll take the shilling and wear the jacket blue There's no trade but it's the kinder So locks and bars at you Thank you John Simpson, our hero we're now back in Plymouth. Thanks to Simpson, thanks to Lord Sidney, the Home Secretary. Henry has been reunited with the baby and together they've joined Susanna before she set sail. A happy outcome. But Plymouth is not a hammy place. Imagine you were one of those destined to go to New South Wales. It must have felt like going to the other side of the moon, or worse. At least you can see the moon. Few thought that they would return, especially when they saw the tiny boats that they would be sailing in. The largest boat was only 114 foot long. The berths were tiny. Imagine a space the size of a king-size bed, clearance three and a half to four feet. And into this space would go four convicts in chains for the eight months of the voyage. If that was not bad enough, there was a crook in charge of supplies. He'd falsified the flour. There was only enough for two slices of bread per day per convict. He'd also failed to supply any musket balls. So on the outward leg to Rio, the Marines had to pretend that their guns were loaded. <laughs> not that the convicts could have tried much on anyway. Most of them had 14 pounds of iron riveted to their ankle, which somewhat deterred attempts to escape by swimming. So who were these emigrants? They weren't the sort of people you might need on a desert island. There were few fishermen, few farmers, few builders, but they were young. The average age was 27, just like in the jungle camp in Calais. And like there, the majority were young men. Finally, today it would be like something out of science fiction. A band of guinea pigs beamed into outer space to colonize some distant galaxy as they prepare to leave. This misfit band of Britons bid farewell to the green land of their birth. Farewell to our lovers and our kind relations. Goodbye to the homes we love well. There is never an end in to our tribulations, for like sinners they've damned us to hell. Here's a Jew, here's a Jew to the green fields of England, now we're parting from you. The sweet fetters of love, they are 
wrenching asunder as they tear us from sweethearts and wives. And on some foreign shore we are sentenced to wander. In exile the rest of our lives. Here's a Jew. Here's a Jew to the green fields of England. Now we're parting from you. From Devon, from Derby, from Wiltshire and Wales. From Norwich and Newark and Froom We are herded together from verminous jails And like vermin are forced from our homes and cut purses and rogues with no name there's swindlers and sheep stealers bold there's poor poaching fellows took nothing but game and footpads took nothing but gold here's a Jew here's a Jew too There's dicers and drunkards and whores There's butchers and bakers who dealt in short measures And a few who have broken no laws to go to the scaffold There's others who thought to go free But now one and gold in the house lie a shackled And together must plough the salt sea Here's a Jew There's never a soul of our miserable party will live to see England again. So kind and forgiving Farewell to your prisons and cells For though we must leave all that makes life worth living We are leaving you bastards as well Okay.
One fifth of the first fleet were women. What kind of voyage could they expect? Well, transport vessels tended to be ex-cargo vessels. The fees were low, so the boats were old, the crews were poor. Even so, the conditions were better than on slave boats. And they were better than on the paid emigrant boats, where the captains paid in advance had little incentive to keep the cargo breathing. Even so, the conditions were terrible. By the time they'd reached Rio, most of the women's clothing was so infested with lice it had to be burnt. And new clothes were fashioned for them out of rice sacks, which made them yet more vulnerable to the advances of Mar Marines' crew and other convicts. Many women had to make that terrible decision, whether to ally themselves with one strong man and in so doing avoid the predations of many. The oldest woman aboard was 82 years old. Nineteen women gave birth during the course of the voyage. The first, Elizabeth Evans, just one week out from Plymouth. She miscarried. But Isabella Lawson gave birth to a baby girl just a week later. Once they were out of sight of land, all but the most unruly convicts were allowed unchained to exercise on deck which helped to keep people alive. Henry and Susanna, they were lucky. For much of the voyage, they were able to travel with their child. But what can it have been like to travel like a family in this way? Just as the families we see today, crouching on those flimsy inflatables, squatting outside the tents in Jordan, or walking the rail tracks in Macedonia. How does a family sustain its dignity during such transit? Across the still and the silent ocean a ship she finds her way along The crew they make no loud commotion The chain at transports they make no moan All black despair to lie behind and what awaits us no man may know Of those dark days naught can remind us New worlds are waiting to which we go As the sun set on the 19th of January, 1788, after eight months of voyage, the ship sighted land. By 10 o'clock the next morning, they were safely anchored in Botany Bay. Thus ended one of the great sea voyages of history. Its leader, Captain Arthur Phillip, had steered the first fleet over 15,000 miles of ocean without losing a single vessel and with very few dying on board. Philip went on to become a wise, kindly governor to the new infant society. He recognized that the best incentives for those emerging from chains are hope and opportunity. And he was famous for saying, how do we know what humanity lies hidden 
beneath the rags and filth of a mangled life. Henry was in the first boat ashore. It's said that the captain was reluctant to get his feet wet, so Henry took the captain upon his shoulders and carried him through the surf, a noble entrance upon the new land. Two weeks later, Henry and Susanna were married, the first European wedding in this place. But thereafter, life proved tough for the settlers. The land was barren, the supplies inadequate, the convicts incompetent, and the soldiers unruly. And let's not forget, they had stolen this land from those who already lived there. But in time, this motley group survived and thrived. Susanna raised 11 children. She was one of the founding mothers of this infant society. Henry, he became the chief constable and a businessman. Back in Britain, they had no hope, but here they found ambition, and their ambition found reward. Where two families had been destroyed, a new family arose, and it became one of the families of Australia in 1988. On the site of the old first colony near Sydney, the 200th wedding anniversary of Henry and Susanna was celebrated by 500 of their descendants. So come, all ye who are lost in dark despair, and remember that the darkest night must sometime yield to day. And remember that the wildest storm eventually must pass. And like Henry and Susanna, may you find your joy at last. It's time now to leave these settlers. They're thousands of miles from everything they once knew. They're on their own. They still think they're British. <laughs> but the only thing that connects them to the land from which they left are the small boats that brave the big seas to reach them. The sailors on these boats, <laughs> they do not fear inundation. They live to ride the waves, and they're as rough as the oceans they cross. At a time when few travel, they know the world well, and they sing of the world they know. But most of all, they cannot wait to return to Plymouth and the ladies they left there behind. Sweet ladies of Plymouth, we're saying goodbye. Roll down. But we'll rock you and roll you again by and by. Walk around me, brave boys, and roll down. And we will roll down. Walk around me, brave boys, and roll down. Anchors away and the sails unfurled. Roll down. And we're bound for to take her halfway round the world. Walk around, me brave boys, and roll down. And we will roll down. Walk around, me brave boys, and roll down. Bay of Biscay, the seas will run high. Roll down and the poor sickly transports, they'll wish they could die. Walk around, me brave boys, and roll down, and we will roll down. Walk around, me brave boys, and roll down. When the wild coast of Africa it do appear Roll down The poor nervous 
restaurants, balls, they'll tremble with fear. Walk around me, brave boys, and roll down, and we will roll down. Walk around me, brave boys, and roll down. When the cape of good hope it is rounded at last, roll down. Then pull on some transports along for the past. Walk around me, brave boys, and roll down. And we will roll down Walk around me, brave boys, and roll down When the great southern whales and our quarter to spout Roll down And poor simple transports will goggle and shout Walk around me, brave boys, and roll down And we will roll Off Australia strand Roll down and poor sickly transports They'll long for the land Walk around me brave boys And roll down And we will roll down Walk around me brave boys And roll down And when we set sail For old England shore Roll down Those poor stranded transports will see them no more Walk around me brave boys and roll down And we will roll down Walk around me brave boys and roll down Then sweet ladies of Plymouth will pay all your rent Roll Plymouth, we're saying goodbye. Roll down, we'll rock you and roll you again by and by. Walk around, you brave boys, and roll down, and we will roll down. Walk around, you brave boys, and roll down, and we will roll. Fantastic show. If that doesn't deserve a standing ovation, I don't know what does. That was incredible. Don't forget. The Transports, ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful show. Don't forget that Matthew will be doing a book signing over at Roots Restaurant.